Welcome to the Penn Humanities Forum. Uh, I'm Jim English, professor in the English department and director of the forum. Uh, and this is the final event of the fall semester in our year-long series of uh, events on virtuality. We'll be resuming uh, in January on the 26th of January, I believe, uh, with Penn's own Timothy Allen, who's going to talk about uh, the practical limitations uh, on virtual worlds and virtual communities. A week after that, we have um, Edward Tenor, who will be uh, talking about virtual afterlives and virtual immortality. Um, and then we've got all kinds of things. We have Anne Hamilton, the artist. Um, we have a panel on puppetry um, with Robert Smythe and others. So um, please uh, take a look at our website during the break and, uh, and look and see what's, uh, what's coming up in the, uh, in, in the spring, as we call it. But it's really winter. Uh, <laughs> our format today will involve the usual uh, break for a few minutes, right around 6, um, so that people who need to leave at that point can get out um, without um, feeling uh, themselves disruptive, uh, or people who want to stretch can, can do that. Um, let's all remember to turn off our phones um, for, the, uh, for the talk. Um, where to begin in introducing Todd Makover, uh, a professor of music at MIT, director of the MIT uh, Media Lab. He's a teacher, an inventor, a composer, and a theorist, all at the very leading edge of new musics and new musical technologies. He's been called America's most wired composer, but his is the kind of capacious, multi-directional, still unfolding career that can't be wrapped up in the ribbon of a soundbite. His innovative, award-winning compositions have redrawn the boundaries between acoustic and electric music, between traditional instruments and computers, between opera and pop and rock. His work has been performed by ensembles and orchestras all over the world. The Kronos Quartet, the Tokyo String Quartet, the San Francisco Symphony, the Boston Pops, and on and on. He's won great acclaim for his operas, his science fiction opera, Velas, his magic opera, Media Medium, which he wrote and was performed by Penn and Teller, Skellig, an opera based on that great uh, young adult novel by the British author David Almond, if you know it. And most recently, Death and the Powers, a robotic opera. I imagine the first robotic opera. Um, <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the last. Or, uh, <laughs> featuring <laughs> featuring life-size robots uh, and a libretto penned by uh, no less than Robert Pinsky, our former poet laureate, uh, which premiered earlier this fall in Monaco. Makover is no less renowned for his game-changing technological innovations. In the MIT Media Lab, he developed the technology behind Guitar Hero and created unique hyper-instruments for such diverse performers as Peter Gabriel and Yo-Yo Ma and Prince, if we can still call him Prince. Um, his music toys are among the most popular in the world, as is his software, HyperScore, which was originally developed um, in conjunction with the Toy Symphony Project, a, uh, a, a now global project which joins his work as an inventor to his commitments as an educator. The fundamental belief driving many of these innovations is, in Makover's own words, that anyone can create their own original, beautiful, astonishing music. They just need the right tools. In this respect, Todd Makover is contemporary music's great democratizer, He's leading the way toward a participatory musical future in which the lines between musician and non-musician, between composer, performer, and audience uh, may be freely and joyfully transgressed. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me, and I hope for you, and I urge you to welcome Todd Mack over to the Penn Humanity <laughs> Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. That was, that was very generous. And he gave my whole talk, so I don't have anything more to, more to tell you. I'll show you a little bit of what he talked about. Um, so we're calling this uh, talk in line with the virtuality series, uh, Music Mastery and Memory. And um, what I'd like to do is tell a little bit of the story about how some of the work that Jim described uh, came about and what some of the ideas are. 
uh, that, that tie it all together. And in, in thinking about this particular topic, um, it occurred to me that music actually is perhaps the ultimate uh, virtual experience. You know, music is the, is the form that touches us very, very deeply, but where is it? We can't see it, and it, we're immersed in it when it plays, but then it disappears, and it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, even the origins, why music exists, you can, you can read every book in the Penn Library, and you won't find a good description of why every society has music, and um, why you know, it's, 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 so, it's much less tied to biological necessity or our everyday lives than almost anything else. So it's a very ephemeral, very mysterious form that seems to be very important to all of us. And uh, we see this in almost every way. One of the most powerful things about music is that we know that it touches our emotions and it takes us on emotional journeys and it, it tells stories. It's not, it's not purely abstract. We know somehow that when we listen to a piece, we don't follow it just because it's sound. We follow it because it's, it's introducing characters and situations and, and allowing us to follow them. But the amazing thing about music that makes it virtual is we don't know exactly what those characters are, especially if there aren't any words. Uh, we can't agree on what the characters are. So music invites us and implores us and, and shapes us to make up the stories ourselves. Uh, that's why we can listen to a wonderful piece of music over and over and over again because uh, it may always bring us to a similar place, but we fill in different details and we grow with the piece because so much of it is left open. So we make up the story with music. Music has a very complex relationship uh, to our memories. Um, you probably know that um, music is almost always the last thing that uh, people with Alzheimer's disease uh, still retain and still respond to. Um, so almost everybody who has Alzheimer's in a very late stage, somebody who can't remember anybody in their family and maybe they can't even recognize themselves in the mirror, you can almost always find a shard of music and maybe more than a shard that that person will recognize and be able to sing and move to. Often somebody will leap up out of a chair and respond to that music when, when nothing else gets through. So somehow those musical memories are burned very, very deeply uh, in, in ways that no other memories are. And the other thing that happens with musical memory is that it brings with it so many other parts of our memories. So there's growing therapy for people with Alzheimer's disease, not just to find the music that wakes people up, but to broaden that experience with that music so that all other memories uh, more and more memories come back surrounding that music. Uh, music simply gets to us very directly, and uh, music is part of our bodies, so it's very, very close to us. The, the, the primary, primal music instrument is our voice. But there's the, the, the huge paradox, uh, which has led me to do a lot of the, the work that Jim described, which is that al although music is very, uh, very natural, and part of our bodies, it's also, in many instances, very, very difficult uh, to create, to perform. So um, for many people, uh, music takes quite a lot of disciplined work over many years uh, to be able to participate in musical culture, and that blocks many people from taking part in music. So although it touches us and although we're capable of making it, um, we're often excluded from, from making music. So a lot of my work has been involved with trying to extend all of these mysteries and, and powers of music to as many people as possible in as many contexts as possible. And uh, it turns out that technology, uh, paradoxically, is a, is a very good tool and, a, and an incredibly uh, powerful tool for extending the abilities in music for people who are already musicians, and especially for building bridges to people who like music but, but perhaps are excluded from making music, or to people who've never even thought of making music themselves. Uh, I, I've always looked at technology as a, as a very powerful way of allowing all of us to be involved. And um, I think that's true, but I also kind of grew up with a background that I was maybe kind of destined to think this. Um, my mom is a uh, piano teacher, uh, a pretty well-known piano teacher, and also uh, somebody who's been very involved with um, creative music teaching along with piano teaching. 
and my dad is one of the uh, people who started the field of computer graphics. So um, we kind of had technology and music in the house, and um, somebody had to put them together, so I, I guess I ended up doing that. Um, I grew up as a cellist, and um, performance, and the, that, that particular instrument, you know, the cellos, the instrument that's about the size of a human being, and um, it has exactly the range of human voice, so it's the only instrument I know that the lowest note it plays is the lowest note that a human can sing, but the lowest Russian bass you can find goes to low C below middle C, below the bass clef, and uh, it extends without interruption to about the highest note that the, high, that the highest soprano can sing. Uh, so it has this range, it's about the size of a body, it, it uses the, an amount of effort to play that um, kind of can take as much strength that you can put into the instrument, and it's also very, very delicate. So it's, it's something that um, has been close to me. I grew up playing mostly classical music. Uh, when I was a teenager, I switched over to rock music and wired up my cello and started trying to make it do things that it wasn't really meant to do. Um, ended up going to uh, Juilliard, worked in Paris for a while, um, and came back to MIT where I've been for a while now. And um, the first thing that I started doing at MIT was uh, inventing and thinking of a technology called hyperinstruments. And in a way, the original idea of hyperinstruments went back to when I was a kid, um, when Sgt. Pepper's came out, the Beatles album. You all know that, right? No? Yeah. 67, that's absolutely right. And who said again? I was going to ask what day. He knows, okay. <laughs> oh my God, he bought it that day. Well, okay, so now we're on a roll with Sgt. Pepper's. Um, so there were a lot of amazing things, you know, actually until about Sgt. Pepper's, I was totally immersed in classical music, and also since my mom had did this creative music and my dad was in technology, a lot of experimental music, but I really wasn't interested in popular music. And Sgt. Pepper's came out, and for some reason, probably because it was so amazing, it really galvanized me, it changed, you know, it, was, it really changed the way I thought quite a bit. But there were, there were a few really important things about Sgt. Pepper's, and one of them that really disturbed me intrigued me and disturbed me was the fact that it was the first Beatles album, um, he may prove me wrong, but as far as I know, it was the first Beatles album that was imagined as a studio album. It was not imagined as something that they would ever be able to play live on stage. You probably heard the story over and over again. The Beatles at that point, much like Glenn Gould in exactly the same year, were feeling that, that there was some, something about performance that they didn't like. The Beatles were playing in larger and larger venues. The crowds were so loud they couldn't hear themselves. And they were imagining music that just, they didn't know how to make that music with those textures and that precision and uh, on stage. So they went into the studio, they produced this magic, and for the rest of their careers, until the very end, they did a few things live. They were studio musicians. And that really bothered me, because I think one of the great things about music is the communication between people, spontaneous communication, whether you're rehearsing, whether you're trying things out, whether you're in, a, in, an, in an auditorium and, and sending things to an audience and getting feedback. Um, so ever since that time, I had kind of an idea in mind of how could you make music like Sgt. Pepper's or complex, rich music uh, that could also be performed live. And uh, when I started uh, when I was in conservatory and then went to Paris, I started imagining these kind of instruments. And they've developed in a variety of ways into what we call hyperinstruments. Um, the basic idea is that you want to make the instrument aware of how it's being played. So we do this in all kinds of different ways. One way is simply to have the computer or the instrument uh, listen to the sound it makes and to, to infer from the sound what the expression is, where the music is going, is it getting more tense, is it getting more relaxed, what's being emphasized. But you can also do things like measure what the body's doing, where the hands are. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, with string players, for instance, measuring bowing, because bowing in strings is like breathing for singers. It's where all the expression is. And um, so uh, one of the first hyper instruments I built was for Yo-Yo Ma. And uh, you can see we actually built a cello from scratch. Um, you've probably all seen Yo-Yo either play or on TV or whatever. He's a really, really nice guy, very, very nice guy. But when I started telling him that we wanted to measure his Stradivarius and put tape and glue on it. He didn't really like that idea too much. So, so we made a cello that looked and felt and sounded like a real cello, but we could put our sensors in it, sensors to measure vibration and air pressure and where his fingers were. And uh, we made a special bow. We made something to measure his wrist. 
And the cello knew how it was being played, and it knew the music that he was playing. So we knew that at a certain downbeat and a certain measure, if Yo-Yo increased the tension and built to that downbeat, then the cello sound might change from a cello into a voice or into a, into a horn or into something electronic. Or if he played in a certain part of the bow, the melody going in might turn into a whole orchestra. And, and he could change what happened to the cello just through his playing. And uh, I've always been interested in building these instruments so they really feel like instruments. It didn't feel like he was playing with a computer. He didn't have to remember a lot of switches or things. He just played the music. And in doing that, the cello became uh, enhanced. And uh, here's just a tiny bit of, um, of Yo-Yo playing the hyper cello and the piece I wrote for him uh, called Begin Again Again. I'll just play you a, a second of that, and then, then I'll play you um, a very recent experiment a little bit. Stop it there. So, so he's, um, he can take the melody, and by emphasizing certain notes, he can turn that into a harmony. He can bring out these bass notes, and he can control all the accompaniment. And it just so happens that um, I just got back a couple of weeks ago from England, where we, since I'm a cellist, whenever I'm starting a new period of work, I often go back to the cello, and I experiment with it, and I think about how to extend it. So we just did a new project where we took an acoustic cello, this time a real cello, and a real cellist, a very young English cellist named Peter Gregson. And um, we measured the sound of the instrument, and we built a new bow. And so we're measuring everything about the bow. And it's called Spheres and Splinters. And through his playing, he can take the cello sound. We have speakers all around the auditorium, about 50 or 60 speakers. So through his playing, he can make it feel like the audience is inside the cello. Or the flick of the wrist, he can take any note and split it into many, many parts and splinter it all over the room. So he can either make the cello surround you or be all over the place. And the other thing we did in this project is we worked with, talk about virtual, we worked with a group called United Visual Artists in London who are specialists in light and light for performance or light for public spaces. So they designed a series of towers and we put the cellist in the middle and these light towers are in circles around the cellist and um, all the light is modified also by the way uh, the, the music is played. So um, uh, the best is, uh, let me just show you a little bit. Um, actually, I actually have the whole piece here, but I'll just play a couple of examples. So in this first example, um, depending on the tone quality of the notes that uh, Peter's playing, um, there'll, there'll be a, an acoustic aura around his sound, and uh, the lights react accordingly. show you something else. Here's something with some melody. I'd love to play the whole thing, but we don't really have time. Here's... Um so again, he's bringing out this accompaniment, and he's changing the way these lights move. Here's a bit where the splinter part, where now uh, the... It, the um the cello can measure whether he's playing um, pizzicato or where on the bow he is, and um, it'll change the sound accordingly. There's a big melody at the end where um, all of the um, all of the harmony is controlled by how he plays. Mm -hmm. 
I'll play the very end. <laughs> I, um, it all it all breaks up again and uh, disintegrates into these little lights as he ends the piece. That's a little bit too. Let's see. You're, you're probably the first people who've seen that. I just got back from, uh, from doing that project. So that's one where um, every sound, every transformation of the sound is controlled by the way he plays. And this light, which isn't showing a picture, but is showing something about the, the behavior of the music, is also controlled by the way the instrument is played. Um, after we built some of these uh, cellos and, and virtuosic instruments in the early 90s, I got very interested in trying to make similar instruments for the general public. In fact, we had an accident with the Yo-Yo Ma instrument. Uh, the way we measured the bow and where the bow was was to put a chip at either end of the bow, send electricity into the air, to put a little antenna on the instrument. The antenna measured how much electricity there was in the air and which side of the bow it was coming from. It worked very well. We could tell how fast the bow was, where it was. But it turned out when Yo-Yo's hand got near the antenna, the measurement went all wrong. And we were, oh, what, what's that about? So, of course, our students took it into the lab, and they realized that Yo-Yo's body, or anybody's body, was actually absorbing electricity from the circuit. So when his hand got closer, the electricity disappeared. And um, so I figured, oh, Yo-Yo's really nice, but he's very busy, so maybe we can make another kind of instrument and not use Yo-Yo and not use the bow and not use the cello and just use the fact that your body absorbs electricity from a circuit in the proper way. And it actually turns out, if you do the opposite, if you send electricity through your body into the air and put sensors in the air in front of you, um, you can measure how much electricity is coming out of your body, and it's a very, very good way of measuring natural body gesture that anybody can do. So it turns out that the instrument we built after the cello was actually a chair for, Yo -Yo, uh, for uh, Penn and Teller that we called the sensor chair. You sit on the chair, your rear end touches metal on the seat, Electricity comes through your body. It sort of messes up your hair like this, but there's nothing you can do about that. Um, we put two poles in front of the chair, and just by moving your arms, it's, a, it's an incredibly delicate, precise, subtle way of measuring your gesture, and you can turn that into playing melodies, into changing the quality of sound, playing percussion instruments, and um, I ended up building a whole orchestra of instruments um, and made an, uh, something called the Brain Opera where the public is invited to come. Anybody can come, try out these driving instruments. You drive a note through a, through a uh, series of roads and depending on how you drive, the music changes. Um, a gesture wall where you stand in front of a big wall with image and big textures like conducting an orchestra just by moving your body. Uh, singing, you can sing anything you want and it'll make an accompaniment to kind of an aura a melody easel where you draw, you trace your finger on a table, and depending on the shape, speed, continuity of your uh, tracing, it'll make and modify a melody. So everybody gets the ability to experiment with and make their own music. Um, and we toured this around, uh, showing it to the public, performing with it, and uh, we worked with a group in Vienna to build a hands-on museum for, uh, for classical music called the House of Music. Uh, I think it's the only thing like it in the world, which is still there. So the Brain Opera is permanently, uh, if you're in Vienna next week or over Christmas, you can go and, uh, go and try it there. So the, these percussion instruments, thousands of these, um, each made out of rubber with little sensing wires inside um, where you can play very delicate or very um, massive sounds. Um, all the sounds that are made get collected in a second room, and you can pick up a little plastic token pop it in the wall, hear a sound, touch a screen and modify it, and then uh, put it back in the collection of available sounds, and then sit in one of these, this is one of these sensor chairs. You can sit in the sensor chair, and by gesturing, uh, you can combine all these sounds and make your own uh, version of the brain opera. So each person gets to create their own version. There are always surprises when we do a big project like this. Uh, and one of the biggest surprises in this project is we invented all of this software uh, to make these instruments that anybody could play, to make music that you could manipulate and shape and control with gesture, natural gesture. And a couple of my students at that time uh, were very interested in these ideas. They made a company uh, right next to MIT, which is still there, and ended up making Guitar Hero and uh, Rock Band. 
Um, actually, the first thing that they made was something that they called uh, joystick music. And the idea for that was to have a piece of music that basically sounded kind of nice but was pretty repetitive. And you had two joysticks. And the joystick in your right hand, if you moved it, would change the harmony of the music. So it would stay in one chord unless you grabbed the joystick. You could move it to various different harmonies by moving it around. And the other one changed the, the rhythm and the accents. So you were kind of steering the music around just like harmonic driving. Um, and they made, they made games like that for a while, but when they finally got a plastic guitar and uh, a lot of songs that people knew, it took off really pretty fast. Um, one of the questions now, of course, is what to do next with something like Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Um, it does show that given the right context, uh, people who normally would just, I mean, how many here, people here play either Guitar Hero or Rock Band? Doesn't necessarily look like the target demographic, but you never know. I don't know. I see like one hand over there. Um, you know, they're pretty, I mean, they're popular, they're not bad, but they do leave a lot to, des to desire if you have ever tried it. I, the reason I was asking is just to know if you had experience with it. The, the nice thing about it, I actually like playing the drums on them because when you play, playing the drums in Guitar Hero or Rock Band, first of all, you can play with friends or people in the family. It's fairly similar to playing real music. I mean, you're playing in time, you're playing with the music. Um, when you play the guitar, you know, it doesn't really feel like you're playing guitar. You're playing five notes instead of all the notes, and um, it doesn't really matter if you play the, the melody really beautifully. It, it doesn't, it's not very personal. It's not very expressive. You can't make your own music. Um, so one of the things that everybody's thinking about now is how to make these games more open-ended, more like making real music. And uh, this Toy Symphony project that we worked on was an attempt to make the most creative environment for children to start out with music. So we made a whole set of instruments, um, similar to the brain op opera instruments. Uh, this one was called a music shaper. They're squeezy instruments uh, that have actually metal in the thread. So it also measures the electricity in your fingers. And um, by squeezing the instrument and by touching it in different ways, uh, it's very good for young children to experiment with things like volume. Oh or quality of sound, or even patterns, like that. And um, this one's called a beat bug. These are rhythm instruments that are designed for groups of kids together. And that one, you tap on the back of it. It captures the rhythm. And when you bend the two antenna, uh, if you bend the right one, it changes the complexity of the rhythm, so it might go then it'll go back. And the left one changes the uh, quality or the pitch of the sound. So you can kind of make it talk. And if you do the two together, I had like PhD students for several years who just sat around all day going, it's like a, the value of an MIT education. And um, <clears throat> we made a, a software environment called Hyperscore for Toy Symphony. Uh, which has been growing since. Uh, this one's pretty lively. <clears throat> and um, the idea of Hyperscore is to use lines and color to make sophisticated pieces so that anybody, a child, but anybody here, uh, could use your ears and your intuitions to write a piece, make it better, to be just what you like, and um, to have an experience of creating your own pieces. We designed this so it was really a virtual environment. It works on a computer. You make your piece. You listen immediately. You, you modify it. But if you push a button, it prints out real music notation because we were designing this for people to write music for real people to play. So children can write pieces for themselves or for their peers or for their teachers. And we set it up so the children were working with some of the best mus musicians in the world, like the Berlin Philharmonic or the Boston Symphony. So you had eight-year-olds writing pieces for these great musicians. And um, here's a little video of how Hyperscore works. Um. <clears throat> Hyperscore is a computer program that gives children the power to compose. They only have to be able to draw a line. It allows you to compose a piece of music uh, without knowing anything about the rules of music or without knowing musical notation. Um, it uses a, a, a graphic line between the <clears throat> uh, and you draw and paint on the screen and your marks are turned into music. As children change the shape, length, color, and the 
composition of their lines, they create music. The software acts as a translator, taking the kids' designs and turning them into musical scores, the language of professional musicians. So that was a piece uh, written by a nine-year-old, uh, that happens to have been in Glasgow, uh, for the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Um, th this was, a, you know, we, we did workshops around the UK with the BBC in inner cities. Um, you know, we're specifically looking for kids who just had never been invited to do anything in music, especially not to write their own piece of music, and especially not for an orchestra. I, I, with that orchestra, I'll never forget going into the first rehearsal, we, you know, we ran workshops with hundreds of kids picked four or five pieces that were really fantastic, worthy of being played by the orchestra, went to the first rehearsal with the orchestra. The musicians are there with the music in front of them. And I don't know how many of you have been around a lot of orchestra music musicians. Anybody from the Philadelphia Orchestra here? No, before I say this, you know, I mean, fantastic musicians, but usually pretty um, ornery and, you know, they've seen it all. And, you know, these guys from MIT are here with these eight-year-old kids. from. Yeah. So they were just not really happy, but as soon as they started playing and they heard this amazing music, was really, these pieces were fantastic, S smiles went on every face through the entire orchestra uh, because the, music, the players realized that everybody has some music in them, everybody can make music, and they felt all of a sudden a connect, being kind of separate the public from these kids concerts, and studying, studying this for almost 10 years now. Um, Part of it is the kids all of a sudden had an access into music in many ways. But even more than that, through music, uh, they had access to feeling like they could do a project, they could sustain, um, they could make something, uh, they had a manageable, uh, you know, in, in, in a week or two weeks, they could have completed a project, um, they could have done something that was of, of very high value to other people, and it was personal, it was theirs. So it had a lot of, um, a lot of effects on, on, on kids' motivation and on, on their work in school and... We've been studying that. And we had such good results uh, with children all over the world with um, Toy Symphony that I started thinking about what other demographics, what other people might really benefit from having access to touching music and making music uh, who wouldn't ordinarily have the opportunity. So we started a program uh, which is still growing at uh, MIT uh, in Music, Mind, and Health where we've been working with all kinds of aspects of, of health um, some of what we do is assessment. So um, music, one great thing about music is since people like doing it, uh, you can set up an environment where people will play over and over again with musical tools, and you can simply measure what they're doing with the musical tools. Uh, since music seems to be one of the activities that uses more different parts of our brain at the same time than almost anything else, it also seems to coordinate different parts of our brains more than most other activities. It's a very good activity for having a comprehensive view of somebody's mental state, and also we can break apart different aspects of music. Melody works differently than rhythm, that works differently than tone color, and measure different cognitive skills that people have. So we can use music for assessment. And uh, we're just finishing clinical trials for a set of musical games that uh, look like, they look very promising for detecting Alzheimer's disease earlier than any other uh, test that exists. So this is, th these are tools that this research was funded by the Alzheimer's Association and Intel Corporation, and uh, they're in clinical trials now at Harvard Medical School. Um, so it looks like uh, music might give us a window into detecting Alzheimer's earlier than, uh, than most other things. Um, we're using music to retrain people who've had strokes. Um, there, there are a lot of people, there's a great guy in Boston named Gottfried Schlaug uh, who uses music to retrain speech. Uh, we, don't, we just watch this work, we don't do it, but um, you might also know that often when people lose the ability to speak because of a stroke, um, they form words perfectly well, but any number of pathways have been destroyed, they can't get the words out. That same person, if you ask them to sing a song with words, can sing perfectly, sing, no problem at all. 
but if you take away the music, they, they can't sing anymore, they can't speak. So how do you, how do you bridge these two? So Gottfried Schlag has come up with a technique. Uh, it's called melodic intonation therapy. He's at Harvard, but the, it's MIT, actually, is the melodic intonation therapy. I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> but what he found, I don't know, it's this amazing work. What he found is that um, if you ask somebody to say whatever they're imagining, and you say it absolutely rhythmically, every, every syllable the same, and if you alternate each syllable with a different pitch, and it turns out he's, the research shows that if the pitch is a minor third, so if I talk like this over and over, and if I take my, pro, the ha, if I'm right-handed, if I tap with my right hand on every syllable, it, the research shows that this is the fastest way to retrain somebody to speak who's had a stroke. And um, Schlag's papers are remarkable. He's done a lot of great work in that area. And we're doing a similar thing with a piano learning system that actually measures movement in your hands, but also we measure the electrical impulse when you try to move your hand. So somebody who's just recovering from a stroke, they can think about moving their finger. And with a hyperinstrument technique, we can actually make a piano key move when they think about it. And little by little, they move more and more, and we, it's like training wheels. We have the instrument do less and less, and um, fine motor control is, is restored quick in other ways that we've found. And um, we've also done a fair amount of work to make instruments for people who, for a variety of reasons, uh, can't communicate any other way. Actually, I'll go back. The person in this picture is someone named Dan Elsie, who's a 32-year-old. A young man who lives at a hospital right near Boston. He spent his whole life in the hospital. He has cerebral palsy, so um, he has very. And we went to do. We were invited to do some uh, workshops with Hyperscore in this hospital. We worked with a large population with all kinds of conditions, uh, cognitive and physical disabilities. Uh, had amaz many amazing stories and relationships. But Dan, uh, for about six years now, has turned into one of our closest collaborators. He's somebody who was in this hospital. Nobody had ever thought of asking him if he liked music or if he wanted to learn music. Um, and he took our workshop, and it turned out he loved music, uh, was passionate about music, had a lot of talent, and also was a very, very smart and charismatic person, but really hadn't had a way to show it. So we made a head tracking device. Um, that's what this, uh, this shows. We made a head tracking device using infrared that allowed him directly to draw those lines and shapes in hyperscore. So he got very good at making his own pieces in hyperscore without our help. And um, so the first thing we did is he started writing pieces to play on the computer and also to play by the local symphony orchestra. And then about three years ago, uh, we asked him if he'd be interested in performing his pieces. And um, he's game for, I mean, he was really interested in doing that. So we made a, a more sophisticated head tracker. And um, what this graph shows is that unlike building a hyper instrument for Yo-Yo Ma, where you have the most skilled individual in the world who knows exactly how to move the slightest little finger to make a, a particular effect at a particular moment. Dan can imagine these things, but he can't always have his body follow what, what, uh, what he's imagining. So especially timing-wise, um, you know, if something's coming to a downbeat and I have to do something now, he can't be certain that he'll be able to do something now or that the, the crescendo will happen in just that way. So we had to make a system which would measure his head movement, which would take into account research that we'd done with him about what he thought about a particular piece, how he intended to perform it, what he thought should happen in certain places. Um, we had to look at the movement that he was making at a particular time, extract the, the core of the movement, get rid of all the uh, what looked like it was not intentional, do this in a way that felt natural to him and looked natural to the public. And we made a system that allows him, with his head, uh, to act kind of like a conductor, uh, to take his pieces and to bring out all the nuance, to change the tempo, to change the color, and, and to, to make a performance. So we did the first performance uh, three years ago, and I uh, have a, just a very short video of uh, Dan performing a piece of his um, at the TED conference two years ago. And um, one of the surprises with this project is that lots of people wanted to perform. So my students and I spend a certain amount of our time as Dan's roadies going around and uh, helping perform, which is, which is a real pleasure. Anyway, here's just a little bit of Dan playing my Eagle song, uh, his hyperscore piece uh, at the TED conference.
virtual applause. I'll stop them there. But um, I actually hadn't seen Dan for about a year and a half, and he just came to visit us at the Media Lab about uh, two weeks ago. And it's, it's just an incredible story. He's now um, mentoring people. I mean, he can't travel all that far easily, but he's mentoring kids in the Boston area, uh, certainly kids with various disabilities, to show, teach them hyperscore, to show them that there are all kinds of ways to do incredible things um, and, and there are reasons to do that. But just people in general. I mean, he, he teaches hyperscore to anybody who wants to learn, um, and he tells his story all over the place. And he puts out CDs, he performs, and um, he's just totally, totally remarkable. Really an incredible guy. Um, so with the time we have left, I wanted to tell you about um, this opera that's brand new. And it happens to be a, a kind of opera about virtuality and, and uh, how human presence can be projected virtually and what the limits of it might be. It's, in fact, the whole story and the, 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 uh, the shape of the opera. So um, it came about, uh, I, I worked on this for a while, about 10 years. We just finished it a couple of months ago and premiered it in Europe. Um, the opera in Monaco, um, the woman on the top left, um, Kalthar al Aboud, who was head of the board, was looking uh, to make a very unusual opera for Monaco. Um, Monaco was a very innovative place about 100 years ago when Stravinsky and Diaghilev and Nijinsky were there, uh, and now it's not particularly innovative. Um, so she wanted to do something that would make people think about Monaco differently, make people think about opera differently, bring in new audiences, use technology. I think she wanted something quite unusual, um, and I think when she went around asking people who would write the most unusual uh, opera, they sort of kept pointing to me, so she showed up on my doorstep. And um, so this led to this project, and uh, Prince Albert got very interested in the project as well, so uh, was a big supporter all the way through. An incredible group of collaborators, as Jim mentioned, uh, Robert Pinsky um, wrote the libretto. Um, I was looking, I, when I write operas, I, I've always been attracted to opera. I often work with novelists or with novels, um, because often you find the dialogue right there, you find wonderful storyline and all of the texture of a novel, which is what goes on in people's minds or narration, um, you don't have to, tra you can translate that in music. So it gives a certain freedom, I find. I, I love working with novels. But for this project, I wanted something, I actually had this idea that um, I wanted to do something with the stage and, and the, the theatrical experience similar to what we've been doing with um, instruments and music. So uh, m movies are such a powerful experience for us that it's been very difficult to figure out a way to, to have anything like that experience on stage. And actually, in my view, technology's had kind of a negative impact on live performance in a lot of ways. Um, I'll ask this audience, too. How many of you have been to like an arena rock show recently? Probably not too. Oh, a few. OK. Well, I have teenage daughters, so I go quite often. And, um, they're not that much fun, you know, even with big bands. If you're a big band these days, you have to play to 20 or 30,000 people. You can't, economically, it's not worth it to play to much less than that. That means the sound systems are really, really massive, ugly. They just push sound at you. And even if you're U2, um, the only way you can fill up a big stadium is to have a gi basically a gigantic TV. Um, they say they have the world's biggest TV over at the Comcast Center, is that right? If any of you see, yeah, I think I'm going to go over and see it. But they have the, so you're on stage, you're there to see musicians, but basically you see an enormous TV with a close-up of somebody, and the performers, even if they're really famous, and even if they're very good performers, look like little ants running around, basically. They, so the human presence is diminished. And we talk about virtuality. I actually think that the electronic presence that's around us is not as exciting as feeling like you're close to a human being and close to, close to a body and close to a face. Um, so, so I think the next step is to figure out how to, how to make human presence much more tangible than, than it is through a lot of electronics. So I wanted to have a stage where the physicality of the stage would help tell the story, where you'd feel closer to human beings, and it suggested a certain kind of fantasy that drew me to a poet, to Robert, rather than to a novelist. Uh, Diane Paulus was the director. Um, she's one of the top young directors. She does a lot of opera. She just took over the American Repertory Theater at Harvard. And she also um, is the one who revived hair on Broadway, so she, she mixes very serious work and popular work. And when we started imagining a, a, an opera where the set 
would in a way come alive and be the main character, we knew we needed a different kind of designer. So Alex McDowell is one of the top Hollywood film designers. He does all Spielberg's movies. He had just finished Minority Report at the time that we found him. Um, Carol Armitage did the choreography. Um, as o the MIT Media Lab is a wonderful place to put together teams of professionals and students. So there were fantastic students uh, building all kinds of robots and machinery. Um, this particular project, I often mix physical acoustic instruments with electronic instruments. So this one had an orchestra of 15 players, uh, acoustic with electronics mixed. And um, the basic story, uh, quickly, is about a man named Simon Powers, who's rich, successful, powerful, kind of eccentric, um, or maybe very eccentric. We, we think of him as sort of a combination of Walt Disney and uh, Bill Gates and Howard Hughes, somebody kind of like that. And, um, and he, it's not so much that he wants to live forever. He's actually tired of the world. He wants to go, but he wants everything about himself to stay. He wants all his memories, his experiences. He wants his ability to communicate with everyone he loves. And um, actually, he wants to still manipulate all his businesses when he's gone. He wants to go, but he wants everything about himself to stay. So he figures out a way, he uses all of his power and his smarts and his money to make something he calls the system. And the system is his environment. It's, it's his room. It's his objects. And he downloads himself into his environment at the beginning of the opera. And he says, see you later. And he goes. And for the rest of the opera until the very end, the main character, the singer, the man is gone. And all that's left is his surroundings. And little by little, these come alive with his characteristics. And everybody who's left, his daughter, Miranda. Oop, no, this is when, he, this is when Simon transmogrifies into the system. I'll actually show you a clip in a minute where you can see this. His daughter, Miranda, who's taking care of him. Uh, you know, he's, she's kind of daddy's boy. She has to decide when he's gone. Um, is that really him in this system? Is, can I still communicate with him? Do I like him in this form? Is there something missing? His uh, kind of research assistant, Nicholas, who built this whole mechanism, he's a very clever guy. He builds robots that, that can help Simon communicate. Um, he actually thinks the system is pretty great. And he actually ends up, little by little, uh, he decides to follow Simon into the system. And uh, Simon's wife, actually Robert calls her Simon's third and final wife, Evie. That's, that's who she is. And um, she also has to decide if she can communicate with this person who she loves very much once he's in the system. Um, she actually has the, the easiest time. Um, there's a kind of erotic scene where a gigantic chandelier, I'll show you in a minute. Um, well, see, this, this is what Simon looks like. Um, the, the system looks at the beginning like his living room, this big library that look like books at first. They're actually, each of those walls is um, a three-sided wall uh, that has... LED has displays and lights on each side. But each wall is actually a, a, a robot. So they have wheels. They all have eyes and ears. And they all move on their own. It's, it's the scariest thing you can imagine. These are, they're, they're two tons each. And they're actually pretty quick. So um, you, know, you tell them, go over there. And the three of them kind of move like this. And they turn. And they, um, but they, they have their own kind of behavior. They're, they're nine robots, which are kind of like a chorus. Um, that comment on the action, they sing, they also move around and, and uh, react to the characters. Um, and you can see this uh, big chandelier. Um, the chandelier at the beginning looks like a regular part of their furniture, just a chandelier, but it's actually a big robotic music instrument. It has about 100 strings, very long strings, that are made out of Teflon. So the strings um, vibrate uh, very freely. So we can send a musical signal through it and the whole instrument can vibrate with Simon's voice or with his humming or with his words, but it can also be played. So uh, in a central scene, I won't have time to play you this scene, but the chandelier comes down from the ceiling and actually envelops Evie, the wife, and Simon is singing through it, and she can change his voice by leaning, by getting entangled in the strings. She can also pluck and strum the strings, just touch them, and so it's, it's a kind of duet, a love duet, between uh, this woman and her husband, who's now become this uh, something else, this, uh, this machine or this other form. Uh, there's Evie and the chandelier. Here are the robots. The robots are about three and a half feet tall. No, that's like here. I'm about three and a half feet tall, like this. 
um, and they extend to about seven feet. So they're, they're quite extraordinary. They, they can move up and down rather quickly. Um, they're, they have these kind of triangular heads that look a little bit like pizza boxes or something. And um, they light up and, and move, and the, the robots spin around. Um, they have what are called omni wheels. So the wheels go this way, and they have little tiny wheels that are um, perpendicular to the other wheels, which means that they can float. So they don't have to turn like cars. They just move around like this. They're very, very elegant. Um, we tried very hard. We didn't want to make something that was anthropomorphic, that looked like a human being. Um, some of my colleagues at the Media Lab make robots that look more and more realistic. In my view, when machines get to kind of look and behave just like people, it's the creepiest thing you can imagine. I mean, to me, it, it doesn't feel very inviting and it doesn't feel very natural. Um, it, it, to me, feels more compelling to have something which doesn't look like it should exhibit emotion or doesn't look like it should communicate, um, but does so in, in a way that you wouldn't expect. It doesn't, uh, so this, Robert Pinsky actually kept saying, why don't the robots have arms? Why don't they have legs? And you go, nah, Robert, it'll be, it'll be more expressive like this. And, and I think they, they really were. So they, they're kind of a little, uh, they're like pets. There are two of them that are really small, we call puppies, that were very cute. And they're kind of like Nicholas's pets in the opera. Um, since Jim Maddalena, the, the main singer, is off stage for most of the opera, um, it was a very different kind of hyper instrument because all of the other instruments I've ever designed, whether it was for Yo-Yo Ma or a child or for Dan Elsie, are all designed in a context where the relationship between the human being and the body and seeing somebody make music and the person seeing the instrument, seeing the result, is all connected. It's all part of the drama. It's all part of the experience. In this case, the live performer isn't there. So we had to measure his singing and measure all the intentional parts of his performance, you know, if he made a particular gesture or a facial expression. But we also measured things like his muscle tension and his breathing and his unintentional movements to get the most complete sense we could of the emotional state he was in and the emotional trajectory at any, at any moment. It's actually a pretty complicated system of measuring all of these elements, combining them, figuring out what quality they have. Um, we always write our own software, so we don't use existing software. This software takes all these different things we're measuring and connects them with these lines to make more and more sophisticated emotions. And uh, this is the system that actually puts it all together. So this is where you see what's on the walls. Um, each of these little sliders is something that we're measuring. And at any moment in the piece, we put it in a state. And depending on the natural behavior of uh, Simon when he's singing and performing, uh, directly controls what happens on stage. And it's not literally, it's never like I move my arm and something goes like this. But you have a sense of his gesture and his emotion, even though it's translated in, in a very different way. Um, another virtual thing that we did, we do a lot of this, but we pushed it very far in the opera, um, was to make a virtual sound environment in a, in a big theater. It's not that hard to do virtual environments with headphones or in a little dry recording studio. It's very hard to do it in an opera house with 2,000 seats. Um, one way to do it is with a technique called ambisonics, where you have many, many loudspeakers, none of which are very, very loud. So it's the opposite of the rock concert, where I'm blasting sound at you. We had about 200 speakers all around the theater, and the speakers could make very convincing three-dimensional sound. Um, the system also calculates the acoustics and the dimensions of the room and then determines what has to come out of each loudspeaker. So it can sound like you're right on stage, or you're right inside the orchestra, or maybe you're right inside Simon Power's consciousness, the sounds all around you. Um, so we call that ambisonics. And there's a second sound system, which is kind of the opposite. We built what I think is the world's longest speaker. It's a 40-foot speaker, very, very thin. It's only about six inches high and 40 feet long that goes all the way across the front of the stage. And this makes one continuous sound wave and what we calculated for this is that with this wave, it, it was a very good way of determining on stage where a sound was coming from. So I could tell exactly that the sound was here, and then it was moving here, and then it was zigzagging like this. So we had the sound surrounding everyone, so you could imagine where it was, and then you could look at the stage and imagine the presence of a sound that you, you couldn't see. Um, so together, that was, that was pretty interesting. Uh, let me just play you a couple of clips from the opera, and then I will wind up. Uh, the first clip is from the first scene, 
and it's right about the time when Simon Powers is about to turn on the, the system and disappear. So um, he's arguing or singing with uh, Evie, his wife, and Miranda, the daughter, and um, then he sings a little bit about what it's going to be like for him to go, and then he goes, and you'll see the beginning of the transition into the, into the system. Oh, that's Prince Albert and Princess Caroline at the premiere. I could start, can, I, can I play you one more clip before we stop? Yeah, yeah? I mean, you have to, yeah. Let me. 
I, I would like that. So I'll play you one clip. Um, I'll skip one, but I'll play one clip from the end. So he goes into the system. I was going to show you a clip in the system, but I, we probably don't have time for that. Um, but at the very end, um, so he, the wife, Evie, and Nicholas, just, you know, it's a long story, but they decide to go in. They miss him. They think the system's great. They go in. Miranda uh, is the one uh, who can't decide. She, she misses her father more and more as the opera goes on. He actually misses her. Um, it's not the same that he's there. He's not human in the same way. Uh, but she doesn't. She can't decide whether she wants to leave her body, leave being a, just a, a regular human being. Um, Simon, the father, um, after spending the, we had the whole opera there, four or five, six people on stage, these machines. Simon says, "Okay, you think the world's so great? I'll show you what the world's like." And all of a sudden, there are 50 people uh, who are supernumeraries. We we bring them, uh, they're non-actors, non-singers, non-dancers, ordinary people um, who volunteer in each city we go to, uh, who represent the miseries of the world. That's what they're called in the libretto. They don't have any lines, but they rush on stage. They pick up Miranda, they twirl her, they throw her down, they ask for her help, they, they, and, and they, they destroy the technology and they leave. And that's Simon's way of saying, okay, you want to help the world, this is what you have to deal with. And when they part, Simon, who's been gone for an hour, <laughs> um, you see him in the back, and he walks slowly up, and he comes behind Miranda, and he says, I've come back one more time to try to convince you to follow me, come into the light. And the, fi the finale is a tug of war between the two of them, her trying to decide and him trying to convince her. Um, she doesn't go, but here's, here's, what, here's, here's what happens. So this is the finale. <laughs>
the rock. Thank you. The robots have the last word. They came back. They come back at that point on stage, and they end by actually one of the robots comes in and says, "That's it. That's the show. I don't get it." Anyway, so they're, so they're they're not the only ones. Um, I should just quickly say the so it's Jim Madalena, the baritone, that fantastic soprano is Joel Harvey, who's a young, up and coming, uh, amazing singer. Um, we did the premiere two months ago in Monaco, and it's coming to Boston in March and Chicago in April. So. Come, come, come and see it. Um, so I guess just to, just to finish up, um, when you talk about virtuality, you know, I think the connection between human beings is the most important thing, and nothing, nothing replaces direct communication, touch, being in a room with somebody. Uh, I haven't found anything yet that, uh, that replaces that. The arts in general, and music in particular, have a magic power of getting to the essence of human communication and human emotion and human spirit. That's why we're attracted to them. So if you can't be in a room with somebody or if somebody's gone, uh, music isn't a bad way to be connected. And in an incredibly paradoxical way, uh, which I've discovered more and more over the years, technology is a very powerful tool for allowing us to make music uh, in unexpected ways and simply to make music when we haven't had that ability before. So in a strange way, technology can bring us closer to being human rather than farther and farther away. Thank you very much.